here we are. <laughs> For years, there has been the debate and the concern, the when, the how, and, and the who, who, who's going when, when it happens. The predictions have been overwhelming and completely wrong. Will it happen in the 90s, or will it happen in the year Y2K, or will it happen when the Cub wins the World Series? Or maybe when a global pandemic called coronavirus comes, that for sure will be the sign of the end of the age. Or when eggs are at $5. <laughs> or when the moon is low and it turns four times and the rooster crows in high soprano in conjunction with the bears having to win a set season, maybe that would be the end of the age. This question has always been around as we lived here on earth. In movies and films and discussions, the fakes, the false, the liars and the deceivers, the greedy and the ungodly, all of them want control, power. They want to control the narrative. They want the prophecy to be fulfilled under their name, under what they say. But friends, the end of the age, the end of the world should not scare us or in, evoke in us this cringy way we need to look at the way uh, of the end of our lives. Now, yes, it should put a high level of fear and reverence in us because our great God is going to be doing some crazy stuff. (laughs) But it should give us an assurance of hope and comfort, a peace and placement, and finally a sense of completion and reward. That's how we should view the end of the age. And in the words of Pastor Scott, as even I was talking this week, Jesus' followers should be the most discerning and hopeful people on earth in regards to the concerning of the future. So why do we lose hope? Like, why do when we see things like that or we hear when people are, are having these discussions, it, it kind of uh, makes us uneasy and get us off course? I think two reasons possibly, because we don't return to the return of review the return of our Savior often enough or even correctly. And possibly because we get caught up in the arguments of the world, of the media, of our own preferences and ideas and desires, and we simply lose sight of what Jesus really says about the matter. Today in our text, as we, uh, the bar, uh, book of Mark was becoming my favorite book until I had to preach chapter 13. <laughs> Today we, we get to this text. And Jesus lays out everything about the future. Well, not everything, because you have the last book of the Bible, the uh, Revelation. So this is a kind of a, a, a little preview, not so much in imagery as you see at the end of the text, but what, what the future will be like when he comes again. And so the question I want us to wrestle with, so what can we expect? What's truth? What's really going to happen And how can you and I be best prepared for when he returns? Will you be on the beach? We don't know. Does Jesus have a thorough return policy? Like your favorite shopping stores? I I believe he does. And today we get to see that Jesus addressed these questions in this little kind of apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic discussion. And what Jesus does, he weaves together two future events that teaches us how to prepare. Number one, we'll see the fall of Jerusalem or the destruction of the temple. But then number two, we'll see the second coming in his glory and to rescue his people. Now, friends, this chapter is full of prophecy and prophecy uh, of which part has been fulfilled, but part has yet to come. And these two events form the subject of this prophecy. Uh, One is the destruction of Jerusalem and the uh, uh, consequent of the end of the Jewish dispensation. And the other is the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the winding down of our time here on earth. The destruction of Jerusalem was an event that did happen. 40 years, just 40 years after Jesus' Lord was crucified. And the second coming is an event which is yet to come, and we may live it in in life, or we may not and see it with our own eyes. But what does Jesus say about all this? If you have your copies of the Scriptures, join me in Mark chapter 13. 
whether in your hand or on your device. So what can we expect? Uh, Mark chapter 13, continuing on in our series, uh, it reads this. And then he came out of the temple. One of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Let's stop here because I want to split this chapter up. The disciples are now impressed as Jesus is now coming out of this very uh, temple. They are impressed with the magnificent foundation stones. Uh, The Jewish temple, some of them uh, wanted to have Jesus in all of this building. Some would have been around 94 feet long, 10 feet high, and 13 feet wide. The grandeur of this building, of this temple, was huge, and they wanted Jesus to kind of uh, join in and like, man, this is really cool. But in that, Jesus pins this question. You see these beautiful buildings, right? Well, as you are looking, because you, as the Jewish audience, you care so much about, they basically will not matter. That's hard for me to hear. This has been their place of worship. This has been their place of ritual. This has been their their place in which they do things by the book. And now all of a sudden, the very place that I love, right, the religion side, you telling me it will not stand? Well, why? For them, that may be a little selfish. And and they they get a little sidetracked here. And Jesus is telling them that you are looking at stones and the full construction of this temple, but guess what? Not one of them will be left. And he uses the language, not one of them will be left on top of each other. Pretty significant, meaning it just won't matter. It's the deconstruction, the imagery he points here is the deconstruction of a house. Not just one room will be blown out, but all of it will be rubble. You won't, your residence will no longer be here. Your worship would no longer be here. And he says, I'm going to separate all that and it's going to be gone. So now they're concerned about the temple, but then watch what happens next. Now they were worried about the time. Look at verse three in a few of the following verses. As he sat at the Mount of Olives opposite of the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign? When all these things are about to be accomplished and Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of birthing pains. The disciples now are worried about the time. When when will it happen? Jesus, can you tell us all of these instructions? And Jesus give them uh, uh, this list that we'll go through here in just a minute. Now, some of the destruction will happen, of course, in Jerusalem in about A.D. 70. But the other events won't happen until the tribulation when Jesus is come. And now they're hoping to get all the details, and Jesus tells them in the midst of details. This is super important for us. Do not be led astray. Junk, fake, false teachings, prophets, signs are going to come in. And you, you, you have an option to hold on to the truth. Or you can go down those paths and believe the lies. I believe, I, I shortened this into a, a sentence this week, that the anxieties of our today should not overextend into our future. They are worried about what exactly is going to happen. And give us the signs. Here Jesus tells them some of the things that would take place before he returns to earth. He says there are going to be a lot of deception. Look back at verse Uh, Verse 5, people are going to come, many people. They're going to come and say what? I am he. Like They're going to try to mock and mimic Jesus. And they're going to be false. False teachers, false religions will try to deceive many people. So you got deception, but how about destruction? 
Verse 7 and 8, he says, you're going to see wars and rumors of wars all throughout the land. Nations against nations, people against each other. Then you're going to see fam, uh, famine. And these are all going to be, uh, be the beginning of sorrow. Or the text says, the beginning of birth pains. Just as if he compares that imagery to a woman who carries a baby for, for nine months. Each week, each day, it gets tougher. <laughs> It gets harder until that baby then is birthed. He says these are going to be the beginning of that, that birth pain. But then he also says in verse, uh, verse 9, be on your guard. In this text alone, for chapter 13, there are 17 imperatives that Jesus gives his readers and his disciples. 17. Take heart. Don't be alarmed. Stand guard, stay awake. We'll see him all throughout the passage. Now he says, be on your guard for why they will deliver you over to councils and you will be beaten in synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. Meaning this message, this life that you live as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, they're, they're gonna bring you in and you're gonna have to tell them why you are doing it. And in the midst of that, I love what Jesus says. Look at verse 10. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to the nations. Even in the midst of danger. That's the other D we see in the text. Danger. Christians will be persecuted and killed for the sake of the gospel. Even in the midst of the danger, Jesus says we have one mission to proclaim the gospel to all the nations. To all who we hear and come to repentance in him. And when we do that, look at verse 11. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, don't be anxious beforehand to what you are to say. But whatever is given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speaks, but the Holy Spirit. It is so much truth to know for those who have committed our lives to Jesus that there is a new power that lives inside of us, and it is powerful. The Holy Spirit gives us all that we need to to learn, to understand, but in this case, also to speak. There will will come a time concerning our future where we will be so up against pressure, pressure, Jesus says, you won't even know what to say. (laughs) Hi, I'm glad I'm here. (laughs) No, no, no. You're going to have the right words for the defense of the hope that lies within you, he tells them. Defense. He says, don't worry about defending yourself. The Holy Spirit will help you, giving you the answers in your defense. And then watch the denouncement. Watch verse 12. Again, this is all a concern of the future. And brother will deliver brother over to death. And father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have put them to death. So I made a wheel change this week. And you will be hated, (laughs) hated, not by some, not by just one side of the world. Watch the text, by all. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So the denouncement says now families are going to turn against each other. They're going to be fighting, but then there's going to be a sweet dedication. Because what happens is for those who endure to this, You will be saved. Our society is becoming measurably less stable and facing unprecedented times. And the thought, it should click in our mind that, hey, the end of the age, it won't be so kind. And so, no, we don't fear. Yes, it makes us uneasy. We have hope. But then the fact that human societies will one day come to an end and this was one of the key messages in Jesus' Jesus's time, both in Matthew 24 and here in Mark 13. And he describes what the earth would be like. It's going to be fakes and phonies. It's going to be chaos and conflict. It's going to be natural disasters. It's going to be famine. You're going to have anxiety. You're going to have persecution. You're going to have family disorders and fights. And Jesus warns them all these things will be out of whack and will break loose. But what he says is this is still a fight for your faith. He said, but those who endure, you will be safe. 
Like, you got to this place because you believed in a powerful message of that gospel that he talks about, that it must be proclaimed. And then watch what he says. He says, do not be silent. Like, you're going to have words to say. Don't, don't be silent and endure. I love the Bible tells us that Christ's second coming will be a surprise in Revelation 3 and 3. And at last, for those who are not looking for the signs, he is coming. And this is why the Bible tells us as Christians, we have to stay on our guard. We have to stay vigilant in looking forward, looking on what is happening in today's world and in the world coming. We can conclude that, yeah, it's going to come to an end. And do I have the faith and the hope? Do I look to Christ enough to see that I will be saved? We cannot know the future in detail. We can either obsess, obsess over it. We can freeze in fear about it, or we can just not care and live in careless vain. But I believe Jesus warns us against all those extremes. Here's why. Because he promises hope for our future. He promises to be that hope for our future and in our future. The more uncertain the world becomes, the more precious Jesus' promises become to us. The darker the days grow, the brighter our hope for Christ's return shine. The stormy of our society raged, the safer our shelter in Christ secures us. Jesus says it's coming. For for another thing, our Lord tells us that we got to be patient and we got to persevere. And that will result in our final salvation, our, our place with him. He who stands firm to the end will be saved. Not one of those who endure just some of the tribulation will will get half of your reward. But no, those who endure through the tribulation will get their reward. All will will, will last. We'll we'll receive this this kind of rich harvest in light of our troubles. I, I love 2 Corinthians 4, 17. It says this, for our light and momentary troubles will achieve for us, will achieve for us. Eternal glory forever with him. He's urging us. He said, you got to be on guard. Here's why. Because you will have spiritual imposters who will come in and they will want you. There'll be many messiahs, lowercase m, who will come and try to lead you away and wander away from the faith. But in 1 John 2, 18, children, it is in the last hour that you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is in the last hour. How about 1 John 4, 1? Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Mm. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God or from many false prophets. Prophets have gone out into the world. He says, test the spirits. The only way you can do that, the only way you can do that, if we be on guard. Later in the text, Jesus says, and you have to stay awake. I mean, you got to fill your soul with the right things that keep you spiritually uh, uh, awake. He talks about these antichrists. Because here's the truth before we move on when he talks about, but the one who endures will be saved. When you and I decided to follow Jesus, friends, we decided to endure anything for his name. And when we do, we will make it to the end and we will be safe. We will endure anything for his name when we say yes to Jesus. Sobering thought, grounding thought, foundational thought. Man, when we say we are a Christian, it's, it's more than just coming to 600 Coon Road on the weekend. He's giving all we got. So what's next? He talks about then this, uh, this uh, Antichrist. Look at verse uh, 14 through the following verses. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let the one who was on the housetop not come down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not return back for his cloak. And alas, women who are pregnant, and in those days who are nursing, infants, in those days, pray that it might not happen in the winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as it has not been from the beginning of creation that, that God created until now and never will be. Verse 20. And the Lord will not cut short the days, 
No human would be saved if he did. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he has shortened their days. Let's pause there uh, for a little bit. Now, now Jesus gets into this, uh, this uh, abomination of desolation. Right, this figure, what this breaks down to is, is there will be some who will come and say they are Christ and they are the Antichrist. It's the false image. And the question each of us must face in our life is, am I ashamed of the gospel or am I going to hold true to the gospel? Am I willing to pay the price that is uh, come with the gospel if I am demanded to refuse it? Am I willing to be a, a public witness I love what Al Mohler says this, one of the sharpest mind in our evangelical circles today. He says this, uh, he calls this the moral revolution, what just happened here. He says three, three things has happened. What was condemned is now celebrated. And what was now celebrated is now condemned. And those refusing to celebrate are now condemned. G- Jesus is saying, and if you read Daniel uh, chapters 9 through 12, you'll see this play out a little more from an Old, Te- Old Testament perspective. Or you can dive into 1 first, uh, first Thessalonians 4 about the information about the rapture and the details about the tribulation and the glorious return of Jesus. Or you can read the whole book of, uh, of Revelation. And although this chapter here is challenging to interpret, I want to use Alistair Begg rules. It's just what's off the page. He says this, the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things. So, so, so here, here's what he's saying in this next session. This will occur at the midpoint of the tribulation. Now, I'm not looking to debate doctrine right now, whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. The scriptures tell us this will occur at the midpoint of the tribulation when the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation, demands to be the focus of our worship. He's, he says, and when he, when he comes, standing in places where he ought not be, he says, if you in Judea, you should go ahead and flee to the mountains. If you're out of the house, stay out the house. If you don't have your proper clothes on, stay away. Now, and Jesus is not saying operate in fear, but, but in the mindset, we should be ready to what the Antichrist is trying to do. He's trying to take our, our, our gaze, our focus off of who Jesus is so that we may worship him. He demands our, our focus. The reference here to the abomination uh, that causes the desolation also suggests suggests a quite specific reference. And that's in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. You can read that when you get home, where now this Antichrist figure now sets up this heathen altar of burnt offerings in the temple of 168 B.C. Meaning, all that was holy, he now went in and tried to set up these, these, these false altars and idols for the people to worship. Jesus again, stay with me, Jesus again is talking about the concerning of the future, there will be folks who come in that will try to put other gods before us. The Antichrist will, will always try to get our focus off what is right, what is pure, what is true. And the rest of this section is a story of utter chaos. Everyone running for their lives in the midst uh, of all of this, this power that's going on. And there's no easy solution to it, friends. Attempting to distract the believers from our main task, which is to what? Endure. To, to hang in there, to persevere, that we should be on our guard, forearmed with the foreknowledge that Jesus for sure is coming back and he's going to take care of us. We'll get to that in a minute. But he said, watch the problem of this kind of antichrist, this abomination of desolation. He says, even the expectant mothers will have a difficulty escaping. Those who are pregnant, those who are nursing, you're going to have a hard time to get out of Kayla. <laughs> Endure. <laughs> at, at last, the women who are pregnant in the final days won't be able to get. Pray it doesn't happen in the winter. He's like, that's going to lead to even further famine. Because <laughs> you're going to have to uh, kind of uh, coop up a little bit. Pray it doesn't happen in the winter, and in those days, you're going to have so much tribulation. Again, this is not to scare us, but to put our focus on Christ calls us to endure because of our hope is in him. And then he says, you know what? God's not even going to shorten the days. Because if he did, then none would be saved. Satan knows no mercy, and he shows no mercy. 
And in this case, he talks about this language of the elect. Now, yes, that is some of, some of Israel. Yes, if you look back at Ephesians, you can talk through, you know, election and predestination, but also God is at work. And so here's why I don't want us to get caught up on this. In the sake of, of the elect, those who are saved, who believed in him, as the text goes on, those who hear him and make a life change will be with him forever. And here's the thing about, those, about doctrine in that matter. You, we can spend all of our lives trying to debate it. It's good for us. But what we forget is God does then call, and we'll see this at the end of the message in Titus, all who believes in him to be safe, to have hope, that, that he died for all of our sins. We'll continue on with that here shortly. The false religions would deceive the very best Christians if possible, and Jesus warns us of these events. And then watch what happens in verse 20. Uh, let me read on to verse 20, 20, 20 24. Uh, verse 20, and if the Lord had not cut the days short, no human will be saved, but for the sake of the elect whom he chose, and he shortened the days. And then if anyone says, you look, here's the Christ. Look, or there he is, do not believe them. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and perform signs and wonders to lead you astray, if possible, the elect. And he says, then you got to be on guard. I've told you all these things beforehand. Verse 24, but in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give, give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. That would have been a good place to shout. Because I just talked about all this darkness and doom. <laughs> but then there will be a day. In all of that, where Jesus will come down in power and glory, and they will send out the angels. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. After the tribulation, tells us Jesus will return. He'll set up his then millennial kingdom where he will reign, where we will have power. And what happens is, I love this, this, this text. This, this great kind of um, astronomical disturbances will happen. It would accompany Christ on his glorious return. The sun, the moon, the stars, all of that will kind of move its way. It's going to be creation signs to the creator coming. And think about this. Just imagine the universal fireworks that God will use to set the stage for his majestic son to come back. Amen. Everything in creation will, will make way towards that. Here's what we do know about the second, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus' second coming will be, number one, spectacular. Right. It's going to be something you've never seen before and you would never see again. We will be in complete awe. It's going to be spectacular. This is going to be sudden. The disciples started this question with, hey, could you kind of tell us the signs? The tell us the when? We, the don't knows kind of get on our nerves. Jesus says, you don't know. You may think all these things may line up, but it's not it. So it's going to be sudden. That's why you got to be ready. And then he says, it's going to be sure. And here's, and here's why I love it's going to be sure. Number one, because he's going to keep his promises that he's going to come back for his people who believe in him. This, this Christian thing, this faith thing, is it, not just something uh, we, we wear as a, as a name tag, like being thinking it will come to pass. No, Jesus says, you will be mine because we have made him ours. Like, he will come back, it's sure, but it's also sure, sure that the enemy will be defeated. Right. That the enemy will not have reign forever and ever and ever. He will have some reign, but the Lord will restore all it back to God's perfect design. It will be sure, spectacular, sudden and sure, but it's also then going to be surprising. Because there, there's some unbelievers out there. That when these signs start to hit, they're going to have zero idea what is going on. It's going to catch them off guard. They will not be sure of what is going on. We, be, we endure because we believe what God has promised. The hope of Jesus' coming enables Christians, you and I, to endure any conflict, 
anything that goes on, but Jesus gives us no precise timetable when he's coming back. So what does he tell us to do? Endure. Endure. Continuing on, it's a lot of text to get through, friends. Look at uh, verse 27. Interesting thought here. And then he will send out the angels. He would gather his elect from the four winds, the ends of the earth, and to the ends of heaven. Why is Jesus sending out angels to gather his, his people? Now, now, this is not the rapture. You read more about that. The rapture will involve kind of a sudden and uh, instantaneous transformation of believers into the immediate presence of God in his likeness. That's, that's the rapture. You look in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15, 17, or 1 Corinthians 15 on your own. Uh, but the need of angels here, and this is interesting, why Jesus says, the need of angels transportation for the elect at the conclusion of the tribulation is this, because believers will still occupy their natural bodies. And so God is going to send this, this army, these angels, that as we continue to live in our natural state throughout the 1,000-year reign of Christ, we're going to need the angels to come and escort us to Jesus' inauguration for those who are still living, if it's us or if it's our children or grandchildren. He says, I'm going to send out the angels then. They're going to gather my people, and they're going to escort you into this inaugural party, this millennial kingdom with me. So much so that Jesus cares so much for us that he would send the angels to come and get us to be then in his presence in our bodies. That's why that's tech, that, that scripture means there. Jesus compares the signs to then this to new growth. In the midst of this text, he now gives another parable or another lesson, and he talks about this, this fig tree. He says, from the fig tree, uh, from the fig tree learn its lessons. As soon as this branch becomes tender, it puts out its leaves. And you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that it, he is near. Ooh, at your gates. It's personal. Truly, I say to you, this generation shall not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The relationship here, Jesus uh, is here. No one knows the time. This is not even Christ. God is going to do the ordering. And then Jesus will then obey Acts 1, 7, where you see that. And then he says, we have to be alert. And he gives this imagery of this tree when the springtime comes for us. For those of you who, who plant or garden, your, your trees maybe are starting to take maybe just a little bit of uh, a budding. Or they're turning a little green. Life will come. And when that happened, he, he compares this Jesus coming to new growth. Now realize that whenever we think about Jesus coming or future things, we always associate it to bad death. Jesus says, hey, for those who, who know me, it is going to be the best years of your life. This is the season of growth. And he compares it to this fig tree and the life that comes from that. But no one know the day or the hour. Verse 32. But again, concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven or not even the Son, Jesus Christ, but only the Father. So another imperative. What do we do? Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when that time will come. And then he gives another illustration. It would be like a man who goes on a journey, and he leaves his, um, his bond servant in charge, his doorkeeper, and he leaves him in his house, and he puts his servants in charge, each with his own work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Verse 35, therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will return, in the evening or in the midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning lest he can't come suddenly and find you asleep. And I say to you, stay away. Jesus is saying, you got to be productive. <laughs> it's in our care, your, your career, your job. It's in our, in our, in our care. you got to stay awake. Do not go to sleep spiritually or when Pastor Tate is preaching. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. That's the, that's the wrong point. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm closing up soon. The relationship of the destruction of Jerusalem 
in 70 AD, you see this all kind of hinting to, uh, to this reality. It's projected to the scene of eternity that it has to crumble. We too then will, will lose these, these bodies and be with him forever. We are becoming what eternally we shall be. Everything in this text kind of gives you this double reference, a now and a then. And we are called to live in the now in light of the then. That we got a mission. That we are to live in kind of this, 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 this mission-focused mind of all must hear the hope of who Jesus is. Now remember, this, this, this uh, discussion, it started privately with his close four friends. And he addresses it and he says, The end will suddenly come to both the believer and the unbeliever. And to the unbeliever, is going to catch him our guard. They're going to be unaware. They're going to be spiritually blind to the realities that govern these events. But he says, for you who, who know, you got to hold on. You got to endure. Disciples, however, we got to understand the nature of the trials so that we can endure and we shall not be shaken. What does this mean for us? I'm glad you asked. What does the return of Jesus inspire you and I to do? What should the return of Jesus inspire you and I to do? Number one, be watchful. Be watchful, meaning don't be fooled by fakes, don't be surprised by suffering, and don't be discouraged by disaster. Be watchful. Not in frantic or or scared, uh, but be watchful that this is happening. Number two, then be hopeful. Be hopeful. That because we've made this step and this decision to trust in him, our everlasting hope will come and restore all that is broken, all that is damaged. And our gaze will no longer be upon our, our earthly things, but upon our heavenly things. Be hopeful for that that time is coming. You know, we, I get it. It can be so hard to continue to fix our eyes upon what is to come because of all that is happening now. I get it, but have hope. It's sure. Walk in purity. I love this over and over again you see in the text. For those of you who know the truth of the gospel, I'm talking about the impurity of who Jesus is and the gospel truth. Walk in pure of that. You're going to have many false religions that's going to come and try and sway you and pull you back and forth. Walk in what's pure, what's holy, what's right, what's true, what's sure and what's true. Then he says, then you live holy, a life that is set apart for the king. Holiness is who he is. Separated to do his work, to look like his children, not to be two-faced and double-sided. No, you got to live holy, a life that is pleasing to the master. And then he says, you live missionally. Let me close with this verse. You live missionally over and over again. Throughout Scripture, you see what God calls us to. Let me read to you Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. He says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self control upright, and godly lives in the present age. Why? Waiting for our hope. Waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself up to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify himself as a, a, as a people of his own possessions who are uh, zealous to do good works. Declare these good things, exhort and rebuke with authority. Let no one discard you. Live missionally to what Jesus has done for us and we can be conduits of the message as we go out. Let me pray for us. Lord, far too many times we, we, we look at the now, myself included, Lord, and forget to, to rest assured that Jesus is ours, that, that, that the second coming of Jesus Christ, Lord, is going to be that great consummation with the groom and his bride, the church, his people. The grand worship and the grand security we will have in the world that kind of leaves us insecure and unsecure and on shaky foundation. 
Lord, I pray today, I think you purposely put this smack dab in the middle of a gospel to remind us of this is only done because of the relationship of how you sent your very best, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to take on our mess, to forgive us for those who believe and repent, and then you offer us life, eternal life. But Lord, in that, we're going to have to endure going to have to suffer. So I pray we, we don't grow weary. I pray we don't grow faint. I pray that our minds are sharp to what is truth and our eyes are a gaze to what is, what is right and what's ahead. That our ears would drown out the, uh, the false doctrine and the fake. Lord, and that we order our lives to please you. Lord, I pray your church perseveres. And God, on my heart now, I pray for those around the world who have experienced persecution, who can't meet at a church on a Saturday to go and walk and pray in the community, who can't come Sunday morning and and shake hands and have coffee and and have hugs. They got to hide. But they love Jesus. And they want to see Jesus move. And they want to see people come to him. Give them what they need. I don't know where they are, but you do. I pray the church perseveres. And that sweet cornerstone of our lives, Jesus Christ, our Savior. When you come back, know what glorious day for your people. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.